Wesley was not just teaching you clarinet, he was teaching the person. And that's something that resonated, resonated with me an incredible amount. What I think of too as a teacher, we are teaching young people music. We are not just teaching the clarinet, but we're teaching them how to approach life with the clarinet. Hi, I'm Sean Perrin, and you're listening to episode 166 of the Clarinet Podcast, the show for clarinetists. On today's episode of the program, it's part three of a series guest hosted by Joel Jaffe, and his guest today is Dr. Denise Ganey. She's the president of the International Clarinet Association and the professor of clarinet and instrumental music education and associate chair to the Department of Music at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. She discusses the importance of providing a solid education to young students by ensuring our educators themselves are well-educated, how she inspires her own students to achieve their goals, what it was like studying with Kalman Opperman, and much, much more. I want to thank all those who support the show today on Patreon, and also let you know that you can now support the podcast directly at clarinet.com slash join. No sort of middleman, so they say, required. So you can get a free 30-day trial of the Clarinet Gold Edition, which is the ad-free extended version of the show, at clarinet.com slash join with code TRYGOLD. That's T-R-Y-G-O-L-D. Also, of course, I want to thank our season sponsors, McCoon Musical Services and Legere Reads, for making the show possible. Thank you so much for listening, and I do hope that you enjoyed today's episode of the show. The new Bakun Q-Series clarinet features a completely redesigned bore inspired by the Bakun Custom Series clarinets. This means you can play and perform like the pros, but for less. Use code CLARINET at bakunmusical.com to save 10% on your entire purchase, and try the Bakun Q-Series or Protégé clarinet risk-free for 30 days. Just pay the return shipping if you aren't fully satisfied. Shop now at bakunmusical.com and use code CLARINET at checkout. Imagine a read that lets you focus on your music, lasts for months instead of days, and even saves you money in the long run. It's all possible with Legere Reads, the world's leading synthetic read brand made right here in Canada. The European cut read is preferred by Legere artists all over the world, including Eddie Daniels, David Schifrin, Crowder Giuffredi, and many others. It offers a warm, clean sound with a great ease of articulation and is now available for E-flat, B-flat, and the bass clarinet. Learn more at your local music store or at Legere.com. That's L-E-G-E-R-E dot com. In reaching out to Denise, I wanted to interview artists on topics beyond the normal realm of clarinet playing. That's exactly what I'm doing as guest host of the Clarinet Podcast. I would like to introduce today's guest, Dr. Denise Ganey, as we wade into the world of clarinet education and our topic, Educating the Educator. Denise Ganey is Professor of Clarinet and Instrumental Music Education and Associate Chair of the Department of Music at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. She is also President of the ICA, the International Clarinet Association, an organization she has been involved with in numerous roles for many years. Denise is one half of the dynamic duo, also known as the Amikitia duo, with Denise's BFF best friend, Dr. Diane Barger. And finally, Denise is a published author and disciple of the famed clarinet educator, Kalman Opperman, having published her book, Kalman Opperman, A Legacy of Excellence. Denise, thank you for joining me as a guest on the Clarinet Podcast. Thanks so much for having me today, Joel. I have known you for a number of years, uh, worked with you very closely on a number of clarinet projects, whether it's sponsoring you and the duo for tours engaging you for master classes, coming down and, and working with you and sponsoring your symposium uh, in Birmingham. I'm curious, most of all, you are just an enormous presence online. Um, in social media, you are regarded as one of the pivotal clarinet educators in the world. Oh my goodness, thank you. <laughs> How did you find your way to clarinet education specifically? Um, you know, just fell in love with the clarinet from the very beginning. And I, I love the story, how it started when I fell in love. My, my mother was, we were very poor and my mother traded an antique necklace to get my first plastic clarinet to get me started. And then I was just hooked. Always knew I wanted to play, but I fell in love with teaching. Um, I was very inspired by my middle school and high school band directors who just were incredibly dedicated and 
um, by the programs I went through, I was very fortunate. They were some of the top 10 largest schools and music programs in the country at the time. And so I was exposed to incredible music and to orchestra from junior high on up. Once I got to the end of my, I did my undergraduate degree at Florida State, and I was a double major in performance and education. And I had a great talk with my band director at the time, Jim Croft, a famous band director for, for many of us we loved. Um, and he said, you know, you really need to go out and teach for five years. You'll learn more about yourself and everything than you ever would just going right on into performance into a graduate degree. And I really trusted him. I took him up on that and I fell in love. I started teaching middle school band and just absolutely loved the quirkiness of the students and the I wanted to kind of give back, you know, what my teachers had given me and and trying to get them started off the right way, hopefully, you know. Um, I remember being a, a young teacher my first couple of years of teaching and having a, one of three beginning band classes be 108 students. I remember feeling so overwhelmed. And so over the years, I think back to all the things that I wish I had known as a young teacher, and I really have just always wanted to try to do my best to help put good educators out there in the community um, so that clarinet players get started off the right way. And so many of them could have been great players and they don't get the opportunity because they just weren't given accurate information or guided correctly, perhaps. What is that information that you feel people don't get? Is there something that one beacon that they just don't hear that nugget of information or is, is it more of a methodology that they're just not supported by? I think, and, and I don't mean at all to bash band directors because they are asked to do so much all at once, especially new teachers, you know, all the instruments at one time and band parents and all of that sort of stuff. But it's more than just knowing the fingerings of the instrument. And I think that's what a lot of students try to focus on at the beginning, but really learning how to teach embouchure correctly, learning the, the mysteries of voicing. That's something that a lot of um, the band directors I speak to have no clue what it is. And it really impacts the sound of the instrument tremendously and the success of the player. You know, things like resonance fingerings to, to help them improve throat tone fingerings and cross the break more smoothly. I think that a lot of times that when we're in, you know, class woodwinds, which I've had the privilege to teach, and it's it's been a really fun class to teach since I was a graduate assistant at North Texas. Um, all, you know, every job I've ever had, I've taught that course. And we try to delve more into what you're really going to see as an educator, you know, the real world, and not just here's how you finger this, and these are famous players and all of that, but more digging into how to teach it so that they're going to remember it and building that foundation of strong fundamentals for them to build on. I think that's so important. So let's go back to your undergraduate degree and the preparation that you had going into the graduation and then the classroom. What are some things that you learned that helped you go into the classroom right after that? Is it, is it that you were studying music education specifically, or were you studying clarinet performance and then got thrust into the classroom? How was that for you? I mean, because I was an, edu you know, an education major from the beginning, um, I really felt like I got a good foundation in um, you know, the philosophy of education, but also getting out into real classrooms and being able to observe teachers. To, I think sometimes you can learn just as much what not to do or what to do from a teacher. So, And those things are both important. I always tell our music ed students here to, you know, don't judge when you go out because you don't know what people are dealing with in their programs, but try to learn and notice what works and what doesn't, what things can you take that might help you in your, in your bag of educational tricks for later on to see if um, you can help a student progress. If, if something doesn't work telling them one way, you need to have multiple ways to be able to share information with them so that they can understand. Did you go right from FSU into the classroom and then make that decision to go to UNT or was it, um, it was it a more long or drawn out process in terms of going back into uh, graduate education? So I went right from Florida State into the classroom and taught for five years, um, first year at a junior high, and then I moved to a really good program my second year and taught the remaining four years. At t getting toward the time, I just was really missing clarinet a lot. I've always loved the students. I'm still in contact with many of the students I taught at the beginning. And I, I just felt like I needed to go and get back to why I went into music in the first place, which was the clarinet. 
And so I made the decision to explore several graduate programs and ended up accepting an assistantship or fellowship to North Texas, where I got to teach clarinet and the class woodwinds for them. Uh, it ended up being a fantastic experience, and I got my master's in performance there. And from that point, um, I decided, well, I, I need to try to go ahead and get a job, you know, and, and see what happens then or go on and get my DMA. And so I applied to Florida State to go back to do a doctoral degree. But I also applied for a college job that just looked like it fit me. And it was a small little college in Mars Hill, North Carolina, called Mars Hill College at the time. It's Mars Hill University now. But it had the largest music education program in the whole state of North Carolina. More band directors were teaching who graduated from Mars Hill than any other school. And I happened to win that one job I applied for. Just was lucky, you know, coming out with just a master's degree. These days, that wouldn't work. But um, way back when, I guess it did. And I taught there for nine years and ended up, thanks to them, winning another fellowship to get my, doc my doctoral degree in performance at the University of Kentucky, where I got to do a lot of teaching, playing with the faculty quintet and things like that. It was, a, I think, a really good process of those five years of stumbling and learning my craft as a teacher at the middle school level, um, which I, I tell my students now, you know, even if you want to go on and be a college clarinet professor, you need to understand how the students start and see them from the very beginning and know what they're dealing with and know why they may not be able to do something well just because they've not been taught well um, or they've not had the information that they needed maybe to succeed. Um, again, with band directors just being so overwhelmed with everything. I never bash them because they, they are just dealing with a lot. I remember those days. But I think it was a really good, for me personally, experience to, to follow that advice I'd gotten from Jim Croft teach those five years and then go on. And then I was able to kind of build what I wanted. I'm um, also helping me get a college job because I had that real life experience teaching in the classroom. I think that makes a big difference when you're going to teach music ed students, you really need to have done it, you know, so that you can speak at least at some level on what they're going to experience. What did you learn in your master's degree that prepared you for that next role? as a college educator. There is a, a leap from the classroom, from the high school or, or middle school classroom, uh, being an educator there into college. Uh, it's different responsibility. It's not more. It's different. What prepared you for that? Right. I have to um, really thank Jim Gillespie and John Scott. Uh, getting to watch them work together as colleagues at North Texas was very inspirational. And then Dr. Gillespie has this wonderful ability. He just kind of put together some pieces that I had needed from, you know, had wonderful teachers, Fred Orman, Frank Kowalski. Um, just, I've got a fabulous foundation from them. But Jim Gillespie helped teach me more of the nuts and bolts things that I would be teaching students. Um, even at the college level, you're going to deal with students who come in with poor embouchures, poor articulation. You need to understand those fundamental things. Um, so I got to watch them um, and then also work with the students at North Texas to kind of Get used to that different level, of course. You can't go into a, a college talking to students like they're middle school students. And so kind of separating those two, I think, helped a lot in getting to, to, to work at, the, at, the, at North Texas with the students, both you know, teaching classroom and private lessons, um, and then just observing Jim Gillespie and being able to pick his brain a lot about you know, how to build a studio, how to guide the studio through, just a lot of good materials from them that helped to lay the foundation for what I chose to do when I began teaching my own studio. Let's talk about those nuts and bolts that you learned. Is that more uh, a fundamental in terms of a correct embouchure, or as you like to call it, engaging the cage using more air? Uh, is it a step-by-step -step process, or is it just you know everything at once, here's all the information to the student, you decipher it and figure out what works for you and what doesn't? So, I mean, when I'm teaching, it is find the student where they are, you know, and go from there. You don't want to overwhelm them with too much at once. But the things that I got from North Texas, I think that's what you're asking me, um, would be both how to organize the studio itself. Um, you know, like, like, for example, a great example of a studio handbook, which really laid out clear expectations, a lot of information about famous clarinetists and exercises that work to help build these techniques that we're trying to talk about. And it is, I think, a it's a fundamental foundation. So it's dealing with all the basic fundamentals, but then it goes, you know, coll the collegiate level going to the next level. What are the next steps? You know, knowing that there are, are 19 fingerings for high G. So if you need another option for a student, you can tell them, 
what fingering and why should you use this? What pieces are, would it be good for? Um, what are the intonation tendencies? It's kind of going that next level, things that you don't really um, have much need for for those younger students yet because they're still dealing with more foundational issues. But for the college students, being able to um, have a much wider palette of information to be able to come to them with, whether it be specifics about fingerings or you know, ideas about how to teach, how to practice, how to teach phrasing, um, you know, using a lot of singing, trying to get them comfortable with that. I even did, I did that with my middle school band too. I had them sing in every rehearsal because it's training their ear and it hopefully builds some confidence and, and all of that. And, and catching them then, they're, they're not so shy about it. When you wait until the college level, sometimes the students get, you know, very uncomfortable when you ask them to sing. Um, and I just tell them how bad my voice is and just join me anyway. It's okay. <laughs> A lot of your students have have grown up or advanced to become educators on their own, whether they came to study with you as a performance major or came to study with you specifically as an education major. What do you find are the differences between those students? Is there a defining difference between them in terms of their intent or their skill level or uh, their focus? What what makes somebody want to become an educator versus not? Right. That's a great question. I, I tell students to only become an educator if there's nothing else you could do to be happy because it's a hard job, but it is so worth it. And I follow that with, I have never regretted a day in my life of anything that I've done in education. I've loved every moment of it. Um, but with students that I see who become successful, it's not always a talent thing. I, I For very much, it's the students who work hard and who are dedicated to learn and grow and I find sometimes that some of our students who come out who struggled more, like in class woodwinds, struggled with the different instruments or the, you know, in brass woodwinds, percussion or whatever they took, because then they can better understand how to explain to a student what they experienced and how they fixed it, how, how they dealt with it. So students sometimes who are, everything comes easy to them, maybe they're, they can be great teachers, but sometimes they may not be the best teachers because every, they don't know how to fix it. They just know they can do it. And so that's, I love working with the students who just, they just want to try. They just want to work hard. They're focused. They take that extra um, time to listen to recordings, to hear what, you know, a good band sounds like or a great clarinet sounds like. Um, they are out in the schools. They're observing different teachers. They are, you know, letting themselves go out and volunteer to teach master classes and marching band clinics, all those kinds of things that help build their confidence, their knowledge base, and just prepare them. I think. Maybe the one thing I see is that they are hungry to learn. They go to conferences and talk to band directors, and they, they want to know more information. They're not just satisfied with what they learn in the classrooms. I always tell them that's not never going to be enough. You know, you've got to go out and learn for real, talking to the people who are doing it. You talked about being hungry to learn. I remember when I was doing my undergraduate degree, there was a, um, a young student, I won't go into specifics, um, who came into the program, I, I studied opera, as, as a lot of people know, or voice, and there was this student who came in and was not the best singer, um, and a lot of people made fun of him in, in college. It was, it was really unfortunate, but a lot of people made fun of him. He, he decided to study choral music, and he was so hungry to learn, and he, he was in the woodshed, or, you know, at the practice room, and practicing and practicing, and one summer, I remember hearing, you know, oh, he's, he's up at school just practicing in the practice rooms, and we came back after being off for three months, and the first, call it group recital back, where everybody sort of performs that one song to say, you know, we're kicking off the year. He came out swinging with a voice I, that is ungodly. It is one of the most incredible voices I've ever heard in my lifetime. He subsequently went on to win the Metropolitan Opera, the national auditions, and was a, a young artist at the Met and truly one of the most striking voices. I don't know what happened to him. He ended up not having a career in opera uh, for a number of reasons, but it shows that the passion and the commitment to practice, to perfect your craft on your own and not necessarily be beholden to one studio style or one teaching style or um, the words of a single teacher really paved the way for him. And it was truly incredible. I asked him, what did you do? And he said, I, I just focused on what I knew best and took all the great things I had heard from over the years at being in college, and I put them together, and I, I didn't leave the practice room until it was right. And it was incredible. 
incredible. Those are the stories that make me so happy and make me believe in every student because I've seen those students who come from the bottom and just, you know, with grit, they just work themselves to where, you know, up to the top and surprise people. And those are the ones that make me incredibly happy. Let's talk about Texas for a second. Being in Canada, we don't have marching band culture. Um, and to those of, uh, of you who are listening at home, unless you live in Texas or have studied and gone to school in Texas, I don't know if you'll ever really understand the culture of marching band and the culture of music education in Texas. It's, it's a whole nother world. What was it like um, going to UNT, which is a phenomenal school, uh, not just for music education, but also for music education, especially clarinet, what was it like being there and then going into the marching bands, going into the classrooms? Right. It was a very eye-opening experience. I was very fortunate to um, win the position of clarinet specialist for Denton Independent Schools, which is the area around North Texas in Denton there, and got to work with one of the, the largest, you know, Denton High School, one of the largest programs, huge. I taught tons of clarinet students there. And it was you know, the marching band, marching band is a religion in the South, pretty much, mostly, you know, I can say that it is here in Alabama too. But in Texas, I remember that students were required to play buffet R13s on the field because the band director wanted that sound. And so I would have students come in with cracked instruments all the time and <laughs> things like that. But they, the, the good things they do there, they really support, um, you know, private lessons in the band programs that most students will be on private lessons and um, so the, the programs are very, you know, they're getting those hopefully really good fundamentals from the beginning, and then the band director can put things all together um, because each student is studying, you know, with a specialist on their instrument. Uh, but yeah, the marching band thing, it's, it, it's interesting. I always appreciate here at UAB, my, um, our band director actually is a student who I taught in middle school band, and so Sean Murray. Wow. I, I know, <laughs> small, I feel both very old and very proud of him. But he's doing a fantastic job he, um, here at UAB, and I always feel like he goes out of his way to make sure the woodwind colors are there, which I love. So it's not all brass and percussion, but but my students um, playing on their second horns, thankfully, <laughs> not their their good horns, or not taking their you know, their bacoons and things outside. Um, I would die if they did that. But you know they are having they're having a good experience learning their craft as future educators because they will have to deal with that. Um, and I don't mean just deal with it. The marching band is an important thing because it's what the public sees. So that's good. Um, but I'm always happy when concert season comes too, and we can get them to really, you know, be inside focusing on solely that sound, that kind of playing. Taking a little pivot, you, you mentioned instruments in the classroom and, and with my role at Bakun, uh, and this is not a, a product plug, but I'm curious when an educator makes a decision to promote a specific a uh, product or recommend a product. How is that done? Is that through your experience, through your years of, of going through woodwind, um, class woodwinds, woodwind education, and you say, these are the instruments that my teacher recommended, therefore I'm recommending it, or is it that you receive a bunch of instruments from a dealer and you choose, or is it that you just go through and you let your students choose what works best for them? Right. It depends on where you are, what happens with that. Um, in my experience, I was able to suggest to the parents and the students what they should use. But I think I see so many times, even students I've taught from way back when, they recommend what they got in class woodwinds. That was the, the information they received. Those are the instruments, the mouthpieces, the ligatures, everything. That's what they recommend. And so I try to be um, really clear with my students that this is now. Things are always evolving and changing. You know, instruments are becoming better and better. Great mouthpieces are coming out. So you need to go to conferences. I, and I tell them, if you, if you don't know, call me and I'll tell you. But I always tell them to be open to new things because, you know, um, some students will remember this is the mouthpiece that I was told to use. And then they use it all the time. And it might end up not being the best one now. There's you know, maybe much better equipment out there. And so the, the, the goal is for the teachers, hopefully, to keep updated on what's new, what's out there. And not just what's new, but what really works best for the students, you know, talking to people who actually play the instruments. And if you play them yourselves, experiencing and trying. I, I love we have some band directors around here who are clarinet players, and they are always coming to clarinet symposium to try what's new and see what's out there. And I really respect that because it's easy to just go with what you're you're used to. It's change is hard. 
but being open to that change can open so many doors of success for your students if you get them on the equipment that's going to help them um, succeed. When you are choosing who to accept into the program, into your studio, what do you look for, knowing that not everybody can come in rocking the Nielsen or playing, you know, the velocity studies and everything, you know, perfectly? What do you look for? I look for teachable spirit. To me, that is the most important thing. I can teach them once they're here. And that sometimes those are my favorite students to teach because you see this huge trajectory for them of their growth. If you give them a chance and believe in them and show them the right way to do things. And sometimes you can get star students who think they're great and they don't really want to work, you know. So um, the students I always look for are the ones, again, it goes back who are hungry to want to learn to get better on the instrument. Whatever, if they're ready to do that and they've got some basic fundamentals, you know, then then I can help them get there and I'm not worried about it. Um, but I, I look for those students with a great attitude who want to learn, you know. This is a very tough question, but what is more important, the instrument or the methodology of teaching? Ooh, they're so tied together, Joel. Um, but I, I would say methodology because the sound has to be in your head. But then you can have the sound in your head and you can't really get that sound unless you have the equipment. So it's kind of like the chicken and the egg kind of thing. So the quality of the instrument can greatly impact the success of the student. If they, you know, they can learn to play horribly out of tune. They might have issues in the upper register be just because something's not made, you know, made well um, acoustically. So it's, that is a kind of a tough question. But I, I think maybe a slight bit of methodology first very closely followed by support of the good equipment to help that methodology be successful. When it comes to the methodology of teaching, do you start your students all the same way in terms of these are the fundamentals that we're going to work through to build your foundation as a teacher? These are the things that you've experienced. You know, you talked about your, uh, your class syllabus or your rubric. Is that the same to start off every student as an undergraduate? Do you have a different one for your master's students? that you walk them through? Right. Um, I, again, I go back and I try to find the student where they are, wherever that is. But there's also always a base level of this is, this is the foundational information you need to be able to experience and to be able to perform to move forward. So um, I don't know. That's a tough one, too. <laughs> so. the, the reason that I'm asking is a lot of people might want to come in and say, okay, I want to be a clarinet educator. I want to be a band, uh, a band director teach me what I need to know. But class woodwinds or, or class brass winds or percussion or anything else, that's only one part of the puzzle. Right. And then you add in all of those individual characteristics of each student. And I was speaking with Mary Bakun, um, who happens to be my aunt, uh, for those listening who don't know. And she is a phenomenal lady and an amazing clarinet educator herself or educator in general. Um, and her school, where she recently retired, but her program started the students off um, half of the year on clarinet, all of the students, and the other half studied trumpet. So they would have a band of half trumpet, half clarinet for the first year, and then they'd swap halfway through. And then at the, at the end of that, the students would audition or choose their, their instrument of choice, saxophone, clarinet, flute, etc. But it lays a very interesting foundation for the knowledge of the winds and the brass and then taking that step from there rather than going in and saying like my daughter who's 10 years old and said i want to play the oboe and i was like oh my god <laughs> what 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 would make you want to do that to punish yourself you're going to spend half of your life making reeds yep <laughs> so I'm, I'm curious to you what do you look for um when you are in that classroom setting in that class woodwind setting, that brass wind setting, that is going to allow that student to take that knowledge and then disseminate it and share it with the other students? Well, I, th I think, first of all, they've got to be able to, you've got to know that they understand and can demonstrate what you're telling them before they're going to go out and share it. That's why like, when I give exams and things, I have them write everything out um, rather than just do a multiple choice test. And I learn so much from that. Did they really hear what I was telling them? Did I not tell them well enough? You know, need to go back and try again. Um, because sometimes they'll come out with completely different, where did you, where were you, did you hear that, you know? So it's, I think, incumbent upon the teacher to make sure that we go back and to make sure 
double check that they understand their we have been clear they understand so that they're able to have correct information and then demonstrate it i so much of these you know methods classes i tell them they get just enough information to be dangerous <laughs> because they don't you know they have so many weeks on an instrument and then they're supposed to remember that for several years then they student teach a couple of years later and go out to the classroom and it's really common for them to feel like they don't remember any of it and so you know trying to get them for example i invite our music ed students to come play at clarinet symposium in the young clarinet choir just to get experience on the instrument and to be around students and i encourage them again to go out and observe teachers in the field and ask them questions notice you know what students are doing well what is difficult for them to learn and i you know a lot of times students will say oh for example like saxophone and clarinet embouchure that's just the same well no it's not it's very different but that's what a lot of band directors will say and that gives students a completely especially saxophones if they're going in with a clarinet embouchure it's way too tight way you know and clarinet players would be way too you know we're, we're way up to uptight anyways <laughs> clarinet players but you know trying to get them to understand the the fine differences so that they're going out to teach accurate information so and then getting to be able to share that. So I have them do a lot of teaching in the classroom. Um, you know, I'll have them in class woodwinds, they'll get up and be recorded teaching the class a certain concept. And then I have the class go back and watch the video and give them comments to help improve. And we'll talk about it in class, just giving them experience. It's one thing knowing it, but being able to say it, to be able to say it in a way that, you know, middle school students going to understand whether it's voicing or whatever, being able to say things at the level the student needs to hear it. I think it all boils down to that. A lot of the college kids will come in and they'll, they'll try to be teaching at the level that they're used to, instead of realizing you've got to take those concepts and present them in a way that a child can understand. That reminds me a lot of, of golf lessons. As you know, I play a lot of golf and I take lessons throughout the year, even in the winter, I'll still take lessons. And sometimes if I'm not getting a concept, my instructor will go and, and give me a different uh, technique or a different lesson that I have seen the same lesson used on my eight-year-old son. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Do you need <laughs> to tone it down that low? And he was like, well, yeah, because Noah, who's my son, he doesn't have the same um, habits that you do. So you have built up these habits, you know, layer upon layer over your many years uh, of, of golf. And so you should try and deconstruct these or let's go back to the beginning and, and look at a fresh perspective. When you have the students critique that teacher in, in that, that uh, teacher who's learning to be a teacher, one of the things that I'm always curious about is how do you avoid that, this, that negative talk, that, that negative criticism and make it constructive, positive criticism? Right. That's super important. And we have that discussion before we do any of this, that this is constructive, that um, we are doing things to help the student get better, but never to attack or tear down. That's totally against anything that you know, we wanna do in education. But I, I, I think teaching them to give feedback is so important. And this is something that I got from my BFF, Diane, uh, who started, um, I joined with her doing these video reviews. We did shared studio, you know, and I've done this with other, other universities too. But I brought it into class woodwinds as well. And so we have a secret Facebook page. So the students don't, um, nothing's going to be public for them to be embarrassed about or anything like that. But they have these videos to go back and watch and learn from each time. And not only are they doing that, but all of the students in the classroom are learning how to give constructive, positive feedback. And I'm, you know me, I'm like my students call me Mary Poppins. I, you know, I studied with Cal, who was a very, very tough teacher, but um, I really, I want to teach those concepts, but I try to do it in a, a kind way because for me, my brain would shut down when, when someone would be harsh with me. Um, and I find students really respond well to, to the information given in a supportive and kind way. So I try to teach them how to do that. And it's not telling them that everything is great. That's not it at all. But it's, it's always following a construct of something with here's something you did well. Here's something you might want to try to do a little bit differently and see if it helps. That reminds me of a quote that is in your book, uh, which we will talk about shortly. But th this quote is from Dan Rather, and I absolutely love it. The dream begins with a teacher who believes in you, who tugs and pushes and leads you to the next plateau. 
sometimes poking you with a sharp stick called truth. That's exactly it. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorites. <laughs> Tell us about your decision to go back to do your DMA. Um, was that right out of uh, UNT? You were teaching in college. What was that decision like, that decision process? A number of our listeners could be pondering or are pondering a change of focus going from the classroom back into academia or going from academia into the classroom. How did your next level of education go? Right. So from North Texas, I went right to Mars Hill College and taught there for nine years and um, had the opportunity. This grant program came through. I was really wanting to go you know, to further my studies. I knew that always that that, that that would be something that I would do and that I would need to at the college level if I wanted to go to a different university or something. And so we ended up being able to apply for this grant program and um, the Southern Appalachian College Association or something. Um, but it was a wonderful program that allowed me to have a job to come back to when I went to do my residency at Kentucky. So I would do summers, you know, and then did one full year away from my studio, which was very hard to do. Um, just missed being there with them, but it ended up being a great experience and a time for me to be able to focus on myself, which you usually don't get too much as a teacher. You know, you're always worried about your students and, and your job and doing those things, but being able to go back and focus on my own musicianship. And um, even though I wasn't doing education, I still took some education courses at the graduate level just because I wanted to update the information I'd had from before um, and have more things to take back to my students. And it ended up being very positive because I was able to kind of share those experiences with my Mars Hill students. I just, it was a, an interesting way to do it. It's, and I'm very fortunate that I had a job to come back to. Some people just have to be brave and jump and hope there'll be a job after the degree. And, you know, it's, it's can be very scary. That's the leap of faith that Kierkegaard uh, talks about that, that giant leap into that chasm or over that chasm that you really don't know what you're doing or, or what's going to be on the other side. Was it like that when you made the decision to go study with Cal Opperman? Yes, it, um, it was scary. I, you know, I was looking for dissertation topics and I, originally I was going to do something on 20th century clarinet concertos, you know, eh, everybody can do that. And a good friend of mine at Carl Fisher, Larry Clark, had suggested, you know, we've got Cal Opperman writing for us. And, you know, I don't think anybody's ever written about him. And you know, um, I could help to connect you to if you'd like. And so he gave me Cal's number and I called, called Cal and talked to him about it. And he agreed. And then soon after he called me back and said, Hey, we've got a problem. We can't, the deal's off. We can't do this. And I was, you know, I had already started the process and I was kind of um, blown away and terrified and, you know, oh my God, what's going to happen now? And, and I said, well, what's, what's wrong? And he said, you have to study with me to really understand what I do for at least five years before you can write about me. And I said, well, can I study with you? He said, we'll see. And so he had me come to New York. And thankfully, he, he let me study with him. So. You put a quote of him in the book that I find fascinating. Everyone discovers their own way of destroying themselves. And some people choose the clarinet. Yes. That's a pretty dark view of <laughs> clarinet playing from one of the most iconic clarinet teachers and educators in the world. Yeah. What was it like knocking on the door or, or going up to his apartment that first lesson? Oh my goodness. Well, I'll, he, um, I remember calling them from Penn Station because I didn't know, you know, how to get to his place. And um, he called me the country mouse because, you know, I would come from Alabama and he thought that well, at that time, North Carolina, he was very, he thought it was very funny. He said, that was your first mistake <laughs> coming from the South, I guess. But um, I, he had me take a cab and I pulled up and there he was with his arms akimbo, you know, just looking at me. And I remember being shocked because he, he was such a short and stature person, but his presence was huge, you know. And Louise said, you know, his wife, Louise, told me later that he was worried about me. And so that's why he was out there kind of pacing, watching for me to come. Um, and then he took me into this, you know, his apartment um, in this beautiful area right by Lincoln Center, you know, West 67th Street. And into everything, it was dedicated to the clarinet. There was a lathe and just stacks of, you know, clarinet, music, everything. And Louise knew where everything was. Cal would say, Wheezy, bring me this. Wheezy, bring me that, you know. Um, he'd have me sit on this uh, chair with one light shining on me. So it felt kind of like the Inquisition <laughs> a little bit. 
And I'll never forget just just putting my instrument together. I was putting the reed on and he said, no, what are you doing? You can't even put the reed on right. You know, and this is how it's done. And everything he did was with such great respect to the instrument. He would never cross his legs to play. It was always sitting up, forming his embouchure, bringing the instrument to him, releasing the sound. And I was grateful to be able to bring several of my Marcel students to sit around me and watch me get grilled by Cal over the years. And, you know, Dick Stolzman would come in to bring Cal coffee and, and then, you know, Cal would sit there and grill me faster, 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 again, again, you know. But it was a, a life-changing experience. I'd never had anyone who talked to me with such brutal honesty as Cal did. And it was something I needed, you know. Um, it's I have, I have a very, I think, soft, gentle, I try to be person and a teacher, um, but I also try to be very strong as well. Like my mother, Southern women, we got the backbone there that you we just very, you know, quiet about it, but it's there. But Cal ended up being one of the greatest influences on me, not only as a clarinet player, but as a person, just totally supportive. Um, once he accepts you, once he knows you're serious, you know, once he knew that, then everything was about you. And he would dedicate everything, you know, write this down and you know, make sure you tell your students this. And I would get to sit at his feet and watch him teach other students who'd been with him for many years. You know, I always wish that I could have started with him earlier, but I don't think I would have been ready for him. I needed to, to get a little tougher before I came to New York with him. Some of our listeners might not know that um, Richard Stoltzman studied with Opperman for a, a long period of time and credits Opperman with helping him become who he is. And saving him from the trash heap of clarinet players is what he says. <laughs> yeah, it's it's so fascinating because I've met Stoltzman before several times, in fact, and you've you've come to know him very well. He is such um, such a different player, and I mean that in a great way because he has overcome the barrier of classical music, and he has gone beyond that, and that's something that I think classical music needs. What was it like? working with Cal and seeing him support Stoltzman, seeing him, you know, help him grow. I mean, if I can take a, a second, I remember when Stoltzman came to Vancouver to play a concert with the Vancouver Symphony Orchestra, and he opened up his box of reeds, and he had them numbered as basically Cal had approved the reeds. It was something I had never seen before, but that that um, that power of that teacher to remain with you throughout your career, wherever you go, as famous as you become, is something that a lot of a lot of classical fans or people outside of you know uh, outside of the call it behind the scenes curtain they don't see that. Right. So what was it like with with Cal studying with him, knowing that you know one of his most famous students was out there doing this, and and he's in there working with you and treating you exactly the same. I mean, he's, he's grilling you the same way he was, I'm sure, Stoltzman. Right. It, it was um, both humbling and exciting. I, I just learned so much, also getting to, to speak with Dick about the experiences that he had. Because um, when you study with Cal, it was kind of all-consuming. He would call me. I'd oh, pick up the phone at my office, even in the middle of a lesson, you know, and, and um, he'd, he would say, I need to tell you something, you know, where's your staccato? He always wanted to know where my staccato was, where I could play 16th notes, you know, just there were, he would just always check up on you. Or I would get in the mail, a little piece of, of, of scrap of manuscript paper where he had handwritten an exercise for Denise, have fun, pal, you know, nothing else in there, but just something that he thought about. He wanted to work, you know, on a specific finger for me or something like that. So I had seen the successes, you know, after getting to hear so many of his students, you know, getting to sit in on lessons or hearing recordings. And I knew that with Cal, it was his way or the highway. So you're going to do what he says completely. And he was very gestalt. It was not just teaching you clarinet. He was teaching the person. And that's something that resonate, resonated with me an incredible amount. Um, that's what I think of, too, as a teacher. We are treat, We are teaching young people music. We are not just teaching the clarinet, but we're teaching them how to approach life with the clarinet. And that's what I think I learned so much from Cal. You know, all the great stories that that Stoltzman talked about, you know, Dick was saying one day he came in and he just was feeling kind of cocky, feeling his oats and playing. And Cal said, you know, it's a beautiful day outside. You could be out in the park with your family. You don't have to play clarinet. And he kept poking at him until Dick got so angry, he threw his clarinet at Cal. Cal caught it, you know, 
But Dick said that was a life-changing moment where he realized he had to make the choice. Was he really going to dedicate himself and be serious about the instrument, or was he just going to play around with it? And that, that's a hard decision to make. You know, he told me he wanted me to quit my job and move to New York and, and study with him constantly. And, you know, part of me wishes, oh, my gosh, I wish I'd had that experience, but I couldn't. You know, I had students. I had a family. I had, you know, I had a home and everything that I had to do. So it's it was tough to find the balance, but observing what he did and that level of dedication to his students was very impactful to me. One of the things that I admire and love and respect about you is the way that you foster and guide your students. And I, I'd like to know how, how do you handle their challenges? Because everybody has challenges. Everybody has, you know, something dark and foreboding in their life. You know, unfortunately, it's reality. And, and I'm sure that your students have come to you with, with issues and problems outside of clarinet playing. How do you balance that? How do you mentor them without crossing that line? while still fostering in them the love of the instrument and the love of themselves. Right. That, that's a big thing that I try to do is to build students up, not falsely, I don't mean that in, in that way, but to build them up in their own beauty, their own confidence, their own um, personal self, you know, who they are, that each of them is very special. I really I want them to know, and I, I hope they do, they, I make sure they know that I am always there for them, that there's nothing that they can share that will ever make me not care about them or want to teach them or help them. Um, you know, of course, if it's something serious, and I've had this happen before too, then you get students right to the help that they need professionally. You know, that we have great resources on campus here and we do that. But just personally, you know, I've had students come to me to come out to me students who came to me before they went to their parents to tell me they were pregnant, you know, or, and, you know, something, things like that, really heavy things that, that for a young person to, to be able to share with you, it's a great responsibility and a great honor for them to trust you. Um, but also it's the fine line that you mentioned that you are supportive of them, but you get them right to help that they need. Um, because some students, especially now with the pandemic, I've seen more students struggle than ever before, more colleagues struggle than ever before, you know, with just life is just tough right now. Um, but always having them come back, let the clarinet be, let the clarinet be the place where you can go and escape those things, and, you know, not escape in a bad way, but escape in a, a positive mental way that this is something that even if there's a, there's a pandemic going on, I can still be growing and learning and I have this supportive clarinet family around me to help me get through it. Absolutely. I want to take a step back to the decision that that moment you decided to write a book on Cal and the, the path to it. Some of our listeners in education or performance or whatever capacity and field that they're in might be considering publishing a book or writing a book. What did you learn along this process? What was it like taking that leap of faith to, to go into writing? I know you were working on it for years. Yeah, it, it was scary. Um, and in the middle of it, you know, when I, I took a um, sabbatical to, to be able to do a lot of the interviews and things, as I was trying to, we had people who studied with Cal for over 40 years, you know, so I wanted to talk to those people who would know so much more than I would. Um, the experience was very different than I thought it would be, I guess, but that it took so much longer trying to gather things. And in the middle of all of it, I also, my mother became ill and, and I lost her and, you know, was kind of taking care of her. And so I had a little break there where I, I just, I couldn't write for a while. Um, but writing, I think, helped me to coalesce a lot of the pedagogy from Cal and, and reading, you know, or listening to the stories from his students and kind of putting together, seeing the similarities, because Cal was very much, every student is different. You, you go with that, what that student know, needs. There's no set curriculum with Cal ever. It was, you know, but there were similarities and I got to kind of piece those together, seeing, oh, he did that with me too. Oh, he did this as well, you know, kind of finding those things. Um, and then there is the process of trying to make sure that you are including, um, for me, it was important to write a book that not just clarinet players would enjoy, but teachers too. So it's not just hopefully a stuffy clarinet book, but something that is a story about a man who is so important to the world of clarinet and to me personally and to my students. Being able to have that experience 
really, I don't know, it, it changed the way I taught, I think, because I, I think I understood more of what I learned after getting to write. I, I wish that Cal, I had begged him to please let me interview him, let, you know, because he knew I was always taking notes and things like that. But he said, I'm, I'm going to write my own book, you know, and then he never did. And that would have been the best. But it was also great to go back and not only talk with his students, but with Louise, the first sergeant, she was called, um, and with his daughter and son, Roe and Chuck, and their experiences watching their father from the other side, just seeing him as the person he was. So, um, you know, the, luckily, you know, Carl Fisher was great to work with. You know, I would encourage people to not feel like they have to go with some um, maybe top music publishing company, but look for places where your book might be out and have more readership by getting to a place that maybe can get it out in the community more. You know, um, Carl Fisher for one, Potenza, there, there are just a lot of maybe companies that that won't be like publishing a, a music history book, you know, or a text or something like that. Um, but we're open to publishing this biography that had a lot of stories and, and on pedagogy and, and pictures along with it to help kind of share who the man was. Of all of his studies and published um, exercises, what are the most pivotal for knowing him as an educator? Um, I'm sure you use some of his in your studio, without doubt, yes. um, and everybody else does too. But what do you feel are, are the, the most iconic of, of his writings and why? Probably to start with the daily studies, they've been in publication for over 50 years now. They just, you know, are they have been so successful. I mean, Dick Stolson says he still pulls it out and does it, you know, does those exercises. And he developed a lot of those um, when he was, you know, he was principal on Broadway for over 50 years, doing, you know, tons of big shows. And he said he developed a lot of these exercises when he was practicing. It was, there were things to help him learn to practice and learn his own music, and he turned them into etudes. So the daily studies, I do a lot with my younger students, the velocity studies. I love those. Um, and then there's one that came out um, after he passed away, which is the intermediate studies. It's got a picture of his son, Chuck, playing an, uh, the A-flat Sopranino of Cal's, which is uh, which was interesting. But those that book is, if I like when I've had surgery in the past and I've been off the clarinet, that's the book that I go to to kind of get my fingers back again. But those those are my favorites of his. But, you know, and there are more. As Louise just said, you know, I'm, yesterday, I think, which is a great comment about Cal as a human and a teacher, his students still gather every December 8th, typically in Manhattan, to celebrate his birthday with carrot cake with no nuts. <laughs> but yesterday we had, because of the pandemic, we gathered by Zoom yesterday, and I was able to have several of my um, UAB students come in. We had a cake. We couldn't find carrot cake, but we had red velvet cake. It worked. Um, but they got to hear these stories. Louise was there, Dick Stoltzman, um, you know, just all of these great students of cows who are all over the world playing and teaching. It was very eye-opening for them. And I promised them next year they're going to try to meet in person, that I'm going to try to take some of my students to Manhattan and let them meet their Opperman family in person. So that'll be fun. That's amazing. So as we come to a close on this podcast, one of my last questions for you before we hit the lightning round is, do you have any questions for me? Yes. Okay. So you guys do so much to help the clarinet evolve, right? Which I think is fantastic. Many companies are doing that and it's a wonderful thing to see people kind of watch the level of things rise and rise. One person does this, somebody does this, but I've been so happy and excited with the, you know, the clarinets that I play with what you all have been able to do with, you know, intonation and tone and just the beauty of the instruments, the craftsmanship. What do you feel like are next steps for the instrument as a, as someone who deals in the making of instruments? There are, there are a few things that I think are, are the next phase of clarinet development of, of clarinet playing not being a formal clarinet player myself, um, I'm much more on the um, the research and development side of things um, with uh, Jeremy Bakun, that's Maury's son, who is our vice president of operations. One of the next steps of the clarinet is going to be, at least from my perspective, um, a sustainability side of the instrument. Uh, this is something that we have led the charge on at Bakun in terms of the development of our carbon fiber clarinet, the CG Carbon. 
which um, the patent is published in my name uh, and with Jeremy's name, uh, having co-developed that, that is certainly one of the next phases. And the reason is that Grenadilla trees, where we see them being grown and harvested in Tanzania, Mozambique, those fields are shrinking. Um, they can only regenerate so many trees. They can only regrow, you know, 150-year-old trees um, for, you know, for so long. And when you're clear-cutting swaths of land to make instruments and furniture and flooring and everything else, you run into a brick wall somewhere. And, and it's coming. And so we're always looking at different materials. Um, one of the things that, uh, that Maury's been working on is um, other lines of clarinets. Like we have our alpha, alpha clarinet, that student synthetic instrument for marching band, for the classroom. You do. I do. For, I use it for outdoor jobs. And, and they're very, very popular, and they've been gaining speed uh, in the industry and, and, and being uh, more recognized in the classroom. That's really one of the things that we look for. The other one um, is just consistency in production, uh, consistency th so that when a customer, when an artist opens a, a case, they get a, an instrument that plays out of the box. That's one of the things that I really struggle with. You, know, you don't go into a store, to a camera store, or anywhere else and buy a product and have to try five or 10 to find one that, that works for you. You don't, don't go and buy a Nikon or a Canon that way. You open the box, you put a lens on it and you use it. And that's the way that clarinets should come. That's the way so many instruments come. And, and I am a, a believer that musicians deserve the same quality and consistency that they, that they buy elsewhere in their lives, whether it's an iPhone, you know, when you open up an iPhone, you get an iPhone that works, right? There's no scratches on it. It's not sealing, you know, improperly. It works, it functions. Um, so that's something that I'm hyper-focused on. And right now we're moving into the bass clarinets, uh, working on E flat clarinets. Uh, and I'm always excited, you know, to come into work every day and see what the engineering team and the production team are doing and then taking that with them running and then going, figuring out, okay, we need cases and boxes and how are we going to price this? And all of those things that go into that whole milieu of, of um, producing instruments. That's exciting. Good. <laughs> I'm proud of you. If you're listening to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Amazon, the episode would normally end here. But today, the extended version of the show is brought to you by Bakun Musical Services. So don't go anywhere yet. If you find yourself enjoying this type of content and want to access the extended versions of the podcast, please visit clarinet.com and click on the join button. Thank you so much for listening to the Clarinet podcast. If this is your first time here, I do hope that you enjoy the show and do not forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Also, we've got a huge back catalog now of over 160 episodes, so do check that out. There is definitely something for everybody at this point and plenty to listen to before next week's episode airs. In fact, I believe we now have so many episodes that you could listen to Clarinet from now right until next week and uh, it would still not be over. I think there's over 170 hours of content or something like that now, which is, uh, which is just crazy. So at this point in the episode, I usually open up the floor for listener comments, questions, guest suggestions, and feedback, uh, but nothing came in from last week to this week. So if you'd like to have something heard on the show here or an email responded to by me, I do respond to all messages that come in. You can send me a message at hello at clarineat.com. I'd love to hear from you. I love to hear from listeners all over the world. And to look ahead to some upcoming content and episodes that I'm working on and scheduling right now, uh, next week is going to be a conversation actually between Joel Jaffe and me. So I'm really looking forward to, to sharing that on the podcast. It's always fun to have a chance to talk to a host and, and sort of turn the mic around in a way and uh, actually be interviewed on my own show so that listeners can get to know me a little better. This has happened a few times in the past, but it has been a couple years, so it is just about time. A lot has changed in my life. As you may know, I, I had children and this really obviously affected a lot of stuff, but also changed my outlook on a lot of things. So it was really great to reconnect and discuss with Joel, um, you know, some of the ways my life has changed and his life too from the whole pandemic situation. So really enjoyed that conversation. I'm also working on having Evan Zaporin back, who, as you might remember, was way, way back at the beginning, I think like episode 10 or 11, long time ago now, but long due for an update, had a great time chatting with him originally. 
And I'm also talking again with Stanley Drucker. He's released a new series of his uh, Heritage Collection CDs, and uh, he will be back on the program. So again, I just want to remind you that if you have any listener questions, comments, feedback, that kind of thing, do send me a message at hello at clarineat.com. And I want to thank all those who support the podcast on Patreon and our season sponsors for making the show possible. It really would not be possible without you, and I genuinely appreciate your support. Thank you so much to Joel again for hosting today's episode and for sponsoring the lightning round. So don't go anywhere. That's coming up next. The new Bakun Q-Series clarinet features a completely redesigned bore inspired by the Bakun Custom Series clarinets. This means you can play and perform like the pros, but for less. Use code clarinet at bakunmusical.com to save 10% on your entire purchase and try the Bakun Q-Series or Protégé clarinet risk-free for 30 days. Just pay the return shipping if you aren't fully satisfied. Shop now at bakunmusical.com and use code clarinet at checkout. Imagine a read that lets you focus on your music, lasts for months instead of days, and even saves you money in the long run. It's all possible with Legere Reads, the world's leading synthetic read brand made right here in Canada. The European cut read is preferred by Legere artists all over the world, including Eddie Daniels, David Schifrin, Crowder Giuffredi, and many others. It offers a warm, clean sound with a great ease of articulation and is now available for E-flat, B-flat, and the bass clarinet. Learn more at your local music store or at Legere.com. That's L-E-G-E-R-E dot com. Now we begin the lightning round, Denise. I will ask, you will answer. Oh, Lord. I don't believe <laughs> you have received these questions in advance. Actually, I, I know you haven't, so... No. Um, let's go on them. They can be as short, uh, or as long as you wish. Question number one, if you could have dinner with anyone living or deceased, who would it be? Julie Andrews. <laughs> Knowing you as well as I do, there is, it would only be her or your mother. So I completely, I, I completely appreciate that answer. What's your non-classical desert island recording? Ooh. Let's see. Something by Janet Jackson or Lady Gaga. <laughs> well, okay. I did not ex I did not expect the Lady Gaga. I gotta be honest with you. Janet yeah, Jackson. I love to work maybe? out for Lady Gaga. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Everyone has a guilty pleasure. What's yours? Staying home and watching HGTV. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I can totally see that. Is Dan watching with you or no? Yes, and probably saying, oh, God, what is she going to come up with next? <laughs> exactly. If you could give one piece of advice to a band director struggling with clarinets, what would it be? Reach out for help. Call me. <laughs> <laughs> I call you. <laughs> What's one thing you've taken for granted? Mm, gosh. Um, I try never to take things for granted. Gosh. But I um, maybe maybe gosh today just thinking how fortunate I am to have a great job in a time when a lot of people don't. Absolutely, I was talking with Diane Barger on the interview that we did a couple of weeks ago uh, that will be published soon, if not already, when listeners listen to this. And we talked about that in terms of of her health um, struggles and having the foundation of academia and having the benefits that go to support her during her time of, of, of health need. So I'm grateful for that too. All right. What is the best advice you've never been given? Oh, goodness. Um, I'm just going to say that, you know, always, always look for the positives. It sounds kind of cheesy, but, but nobody's ever really said that. But I think, you know, I've been in some pretty dark situations before but if you, you can find something positive and learn something from every experience you have, so maybe that would be it, even if they're bad ones. What is your go-to scale or study? Just one. As a book or? Book or exercise, anything. It could be that one piece of paper that Cal mailed to you. Oh, gosh. I think I have to go with Behrman because that's the start of my day, you know. <laughs> Behrman and body make them. Yeah, he said one though, so I'll go with Behrman. My students will laugh. Yes. <laughs> if the pandemic taught you anything, what is it? We are all connected and um, that we can still continue on. And if we do it together, if we work together. What's on your nightstand? 
my iPad to read books at night and uh, melatonin <laughs> and a picture. I have um, little paw prints of Coops and Sophie and, and my cat that I, my three very special animals that I lost not too long ago. Um, so I always kind of touch them at night and kind of, you know, just remember. And that's it. Your best road trip hack. And, I, and the reason I ask this is I know <laughs> you are infamous for your road trips, uh, hopping in the car with Dan or with Diane and going on road trips. So what's your best road trip hack? Make sure you know where you can stop to eat. <laughs> you get something to eat. That's always important. Because when you're driving, calories don't count. We always say that. Um, and, then, <laughs> <laughs> um, and, I th and if you're traveling, I love to travel with my dog. I have a sling for her in the back. So it's just like, you know, driving and I've got Marley right back there, my big old husky. And uh, I can hook her in safely and travel anywhere with her. And I know she's okay. <laughs> Dogs and food. That's good. <laughs> Denise, thank you for taking the time to join me today and for sharing your knowledge and experience with our listeners. Finally, thanks to you, our valued listeners, for subscribing to the Clarinate Podcast and supporting Sean's work. It's truly a labor of love. Signing off from Vancouver, Canada, I'm Joel Jaffe, guest host of the Clarinate Podcast. <laughs>